Welcome everyone, glad to have you. My name is Ashley Owen Smith and I am faculty in the School of Public Health at Georgia State University and a co-director for community engagement for the Prevention Research Center. For those of you who are less familiar with the PRC, we are a network of academic research facilities in the United States to study how people and their communities can avoid or counter the risk for chronic disease. And through rigorous research, each center conducts at least one main research project with underserved populations that have high rates of disease and disability. Our PRC at Georgia State is headquartered on the Clarkston campus and works with community organizations, state and local governments, residents, and other partners in Clarkston, Georgia to develop, implement, and evaluate culturally and linguistically appropriate interventions to address the disparities and determinants of health for migrants and refugees and to disseminate this work. This is our monthly brown bag workshop and today this month we are pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Orr to join us. Dr. Orr is a nationally certified counselor and licensed professional counselor in Georgia. His teaching and research interests include group work, social justice, supervision, mindfulness, multicultural counseling, theory development, and professional counselor identity. And today we're specifically going to be thinking about what is meant by trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive care. How do we incorporate an understanding of trauma into our work, specifically with refugee, immigrant, and migrant communities? And how might trauma impact our research with and development of programs for these communities in unique and often complex ways? Before I turn it over to Dr. Ora, just a few housekeeping things. Um, I've muted everyone. If you do have a question or comment, please raise your hand or put it in the chat, and I will be sure to try to uh, integrate that comment or question um, when time allows. Um, and Dr. Ora, feel free to chime in about how you would like to uh, conduct the session if you want people to interject with questions along the way or if you want them to hold them till the end we can do either so i'll let you comment on that um, but i will be monitoring the chat and at that at this point i will turn it over to you dr or and i'm going to stop sharing this page so that we can see one another Lovely. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you all for being here. Would you do me a quick favor? Uh, just pop on your camera really quick. Just, just for a moment. I just, I like to see faces really quick to see that there are people out there behind the behind those little screens. It gives me a sense of who I'm talking with. Hey, everybody! Woo! Yeah, as Ashley said, I'm, I'm a group worker. I like to be like in interaction with people. So, okay, you can mute again. That's fine. Um, I'll try to mute my face so you'll uh, be able to uh, to see my slideshow in a little bit. It's really exciting to be here with you today. Um, exciting. Uh, I love uh, presenting and talking to folks. I love thinking about uh, the work that we do uh, and our practice. How can we be more intentional uh, in our work across all kinds of populations with all kinds of uh, issues? Um, and so today we're going to spend a little time digging into some of the questions. Um, let's see. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Allow me to go. So I'm going to share my slideshow with you. Um, beautiful. Cool. Okay. So um, can you see that? Just get our yield. So thumbs up. Okay. Cool. 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 Great. So. Um, uh, we're going to spend a little time today addressing some of the, um, questions. And really thinking about, uh, trauma aware care. So in all candor, um, had a great meeting with Ashley kind of thinking about and processing some of, uh, this topic. And it is an enormously critical topic to address and think about, and an hour's time is not nearly sufficient uh, to dig into it. And so I tried to pull it apart a little bit, put it back together, pull it apart, put it back together. Um, so we'll see where uh, where we get today. Um, I would love any kinds of questions. I tend to do things a lot more interactive. Um, 
uh, in a much more interactive way. And so if you do have questions, please uh, pop them into the chat. Um, and I want to make sure that we spend time at the end for discussion. Um, I put a spider web up here. I think it's a great metaphor. We'll, we'll, I'll use metaphors a lot uh, through our time together uh, because it's, there's a lot of complexity when we think about uh, trauma and trauma's impact on our lives, on our clients' lives, on our participants' lives um, throughout. And uh, it can be really beautiful to see how it, the structure uh, goes together for a person's life but you know, spider webs are kind of sticky, right? And you can get trapped and caught in them. And it's really uh, uh, easy to get entangled in a lot of those stories and a lot of those experiences. So kind of thinking about uh, our time together today, let's see if I can advance this through. Just really quickly, we're gonna go through some introductions. Um, I'm gonna talk about trauma aware care, a basic understanding of trauma response, some overview of consequences of trauma and lasting impacts. Uh, incorporating an understanding of trauma into your work, uh, and then questions and discussions. Again, I'll um, I'm gonna grab my phone so I have the time. Uh, recognizing that we have an hour together, um, I'm always happy to start these conversations here and then continue conversations uh, with anyone who's interested beyond this. Um, and in True form and true nature. I packed a lot into this presentation, and so I'll ask you to bear with me as we go through. Um, it's a really complex topic, and I wanted to try and melt it down into an hour's time, but we may um, we may jump around a little bit. So just kind of bear with me, roll with me as uh, as we go through things, and I'll try to be as organized as possible. So the first thing I'd want to start with is our question: How do you? Define trauma informed care. So maybe you can think about it for yourself. We're going to just take a little minute. What do you consider trauma informed care? How do, how do you define that? What do you mean when you say trauma informed care? If you'd like, you can pop some of those responses into chat. It's less for me to see and more for, one in, for uh, you to see one another's responses. So how do you define trauma-informed care? Let's give you a minute to think about that. All right, hopefully you've had some time to think about it. Um, maybe some of you have decided to share some of your comments and you can take a minute to read. Colleagues and peers have written. It's really important in the work that all of us do, wherever you are, whether you're a researcher, a practitioner, a community partner, a community member, to bring intentionality into your day-to-day -day work and your day-to-day -day activities. And we'll see as we move through our time together that really I'm gonna invite you to be intentional, intentional across all levels. That means taking time, to actually ask yourself these questions and come up with some answers. Like how do, like what is trauma-informed care? What do I mean when I say that? And once I have a definition from it, how do I operate from that definition? I'm going to toss up a, a SAMHSA definition of trauma-informed care. It's pretty inclusive and referred to in a lot of different systems and situations that folks look to this definition. Give me a minute to read it. You see the definition of trauma-informed care from, from SAMHSA really incorporates both 
trauma awareness and trauma responsiveness. And there's two pieces that need to come together to be trauma informed. So when we're informed of something, we don't only know about it, we know what to do with it. We know how to act or behave in accordance with that information. And so we'll think about being trauma aware, or trauma responsive, and I'm, I'm going to pull apart a little bit um, kind of this definition. Um, because as I understand from some of the work that you're doing, I, I'm new to the PRC, I'm new to kind of uh, a lot of these groups. I recognize a lot of them are invested in uh, kind of the knowledge generation and knowledge acquisition and providing services. And so um, then there are others that are kind of seeking to be responsive. And so I'll, I tend to kind of move towards, I understand community partners would be a part of this group as well. And so instead of trying to stay at a high academic level or just a practitioner level, I'm trying to get it really like the base level of what we need when we work uh, in diverse spaces and diverse places, especially with groups who would identify um, with refugee status or immigrant status or migrant status. Each one of those statuses imply that these folks have been displaced either by choice or by circumstance to move somewhere else, and that can be a tra traumatic experience. If you've ever moved in your life, goodness gracious, there's a lot that changes and a lot of things that shift for a person when you move into these new places. And so just the nature of relocating can be a traumatic experience. And so at the very base of, of all of our work, we need to bring a sense of trauma awareness. And so I broke out the larger definition into these four dimensions of realizing the experiences of trauma are common and pervasive. We all have trauma narratives. We all have trauma experiences. We all have trauma stories, all of us. I'm a person on the planet, some, uh, some uh, philosophers will quip, right? That just by nature of being human is a traumatic experience, right? That you're here uh, on earth. You talk to some of the uh, existentialists, they may say that birth is a first traumatic experience, right? And we seek relief from that traumatic experience throughout life until ultimately death when we don't have to worry about it anymore, right? So thinking about our work, realizing it's the part of being aware, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma, it's also on that awareness spectrum. Then when we think about our policies or our knowledge and what we do with that and the actions that we take, then we're moving into that responsive category. And there's some real um, important responsibility and accountability pieces of once we have developed awareness, how are we responsive uh, to that awareness? And then the last thing is that as we're working with uh, groups that we have acknowledged carry trauma nar narratives or, or continuing to live out crisis situations and experience trauma that we want to do everything we can do to be really responsive. That is a great tune. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, we are responding appropriately. All right, I warned you ahead of time. I love metaphors. I'm a metaphor guy and we're going to go through a lot of them. So something that I didn't tell you about myself initially um, in my introduction, I've been in Georgia State now for about 15 years. And primarily when I think about my identity um, in the world, I'm first and foremost a clinician. So I work with um, folks in private practice and all kinds of environments. I even think about and conceptualize my work here uh, in the academy from a clinical standpoint. I think about myself uh, as an agent of change and transformation everywhere I go. And so I think in terms of service provision. Other thing I do in my spare time, I love bees. I'm a beekeeper. So if there are any bee people out in the audience, I want to know you. All right, this is a little bit of my networking. So this is how you can pay me back. Is like, I want to know bee people. Bee people are a particular lot put myself in there, um, but most all of us have had some experience with bees at some point in our lives. Right? We kind of know some basic things about bees, right? They sting, right? 
Um, you may be allergic to bees. You may not be allergic to bees, right? But you have some awareness. They make honey. Uh, they also produce wax. And so you kind of have had a product from a bee or experienced the bee. Certainly, if you've been uh, in a Georgia springtime, you have seen all kinds of bees around. Uh, really, we're in the height of pollen season right now. Bees love pollen. So what I put for you up there is a typical uh, hive, right? This is a hive box. I want you to kind of look at that and uh, see what you notice about that hive box. Maybe you'll notice kind of down in this area, uh, there's some bees in there. This is what a typical Lynchburg hive looks like. The bees inside. So they kind of generally have an awareness of this beehive. You know it's there. You know there are bees in there. You know there might be some honey, something really valuable, but you also know that uh, there might be some danger. So if those bees get a, get a stinging, it might, might not be so comfortable. I'll show you this picture. Can you see that okay? So this, you can see on the outside, I have a zoomed-in view. Oh, look at all those bees. What is going on? Think about what's happening there. So if you're kind of just a person who knows something about bees, you know, bees live in hives, you know, they have honey. You'd look at this and comparing this picture on uh, the left to this picture here in the center, like well, something's wrong, something's different about that, right? Something's going on. I have an awareness that something is happening. I know I should now be, the bees are no longer inside of their house, they're on the outside. I need to be cautious. I need to be a little careful around them. I'm not sure if they're sensing danger or I need to sense some danger. I just know that there's something there that is causing alarm or concern. Right? So that pause there for a minute. Metaphor I want to draw is that similar to working with clients or anyone who we're aware has some trauma. They're either carrying some trauma, they have some traumatic experience. We either know this from their story or know this from the context of where they are and how they're showing up for service. Right? So at this basic level, we would know, uh, I need to move with caution. I need to show lots of respect. I need to show lots of care. I need to show lots of concern. I need to make sure there's a boundary around those bees, that they're okay, but that I'm okay too. And for many of us, this is a good place to stop. And if you don't know a little bit about beekeeping or what's going on, it's probably best that you keep your distance. And now you would change your behaviors, right? You probably wouldn't be flailing around these bees. You wouldn't be making like bear noises, like because that might disturb them. Right? You wouldn't be doing any of these things. You'd be whoop, time to be cautious. And so it's again similar to working with clients that have trauma narratives or traumatic experiences. We need to be cautious in our approach. Oftentimes, what happens when we work with client populations with all of the best intentions, without knowing how to be responsive. We go in and we would rip off the top of this beehive and start to do our work. Because maybe we want honey. Like we know honey is going to be great. We're actually going to use the honey to give back to the bees to build another colony. But unless we know how to manage those bees and what to do with those bees, it's going to lead to danger, danger for ourselves, but also danger for the bees. It would kill the bees. And it's similar with our clients working through trauma narratives. But unless we are skilled to be responsive or we have systems in place to be responsive, moving beyond trot, like anything outside of that awareness, caution, and understanding starts to endanger not only ourselves, but especially our bees and especially our clients. So thinking about this trauma informed, I want us to be aware that kind of how do we interact with our clients? At what point are we coming in to work with them? And how can we be more sensitive and more responsive? 
We'll get to some of those tips a little bit later. But a basic easy one is be knowledgeable, right? Know what's going on. So if you're not a bee person, I can tell you this behavior of bees is a sign of health within the hive. This picture was taken in the summer. You can tell by some of the growth in the background. It's hot out. When bees get overheated inside, they come out of the hive and it's called bearding. They create a beard on the outside of the hive to cool the interior of the hive. So this is actually a sign of a very healthy functioning summer hive. But you wouldn't know unless you knew something about bees. Come back to that in a little bit. What I wanna talk about now um, is a, uh, some information, just really basic for understanding trauma and how trauma experiences impact us over our lifespan. And for some of us, this may be really old information. For some of us, this may be new information, but it's important information to revisit again and again and again. We can never say it enough. So we'll give you, take you on a journey for a minute. So what I'll ask you to do is to go with me on a little bit of a journey here. We've got this nice like line, this map charted out. And for you and I to go on this journey, you're going to be collecting some things along the way. You want to have lots of lived experiences and memories of this beautiful journey. And so this line here is going to represent your life. This is your lifeline, the journey that you're going on in life. And to collect all those beautiful and wonderful experiences, I'm going to give you a backpack. It's empty. You can fill it with anything that seems relevant or significant to you. And along the way, as we move through life, I'm gonna ask you to think about all of the wonderful positive experiences in your life as flowers, as rich and diverse and beautiful as this field of wildflowers. So as we're walking along, you've got your backpack open, you see this beautiful flower and you put it into your backpack. Maybe it's a, a first kiss. Maybe um, it's a graduation experience. Maybe it's uh, being picked first for the soccer team, right? I just, there are all kinds of experiences. A birthday, they can be big flowers, they can be small flowers, they can be budding flowers, but you collect all of these beautiful flowers. Now, knowing how life proceeds, you won't only collect these beautiful, wonderful memories, you'll also have some difficult, maybe challenging, and maybe even terrifying experiences along the way. And those are going to be represented by stones. And so maybe you'll have some little pebbles, some disappointments, some frustrations along the way. Maybe you'll have some larger, sharp and jagged rocks, crisis situations, life-threatening situations. And maybe along the way, as we're journeying together, not only will you encounter these stones, but Hey, I might even throw some of these stones at you, calling into question our relationship and future relationships with others whom you trust and rely on. So as you're going, you're putting both these flowers and these stones into the same backpack. Do you think about, imagine what that's going to be like. All right, so. I'd ask for audience participation, but I'll just kind of fill in the blanks. All right, I'm thinking about a backpack. I put a flower in there and then I put a stone. What's going to happen to that flower? Well, that stone is probably going to tear that flower up as it's moving around in the backpack. And as I'm walking, well, wouldn't you know, those stones create a lot more weight than those flowers. It gets heavier as I add the larger stones and some of these big old rocks into that backpack, it gets heavy. 
heavier and heavier. And because these stones are all various sizes, they don't situate well in my backpack. Right? Some are like poking me in the back. Some are shifting one way and pulling down on this shoulder. Some are pulling down on the other. Right? So it creates this experience of disruption and discomfort as I move through. And so this backpack, under ideal circumstances, we take these stones, we put them in all of these various pockets so that they can stay separate from the flowers, they can balance out the backpack, or they can go in this compartment in the front that I can visit them when I need them or I can close them when I don't. And in our clients who are experiencing many refugee status, immigrant status, or migrant status, I have a whole host of stones that get added so quickly, they don't have time to stop and sort them out into these different places. And so those traumatic experiences kind of stay with a person. We'll spend a lot of time on this, but as you encounter each one of your stones, right, we can know that there's a fear and defense cascade that happens when we're experiencing trauma or traumatic events. Familiar with the fright, flight, fight, kind of stops on there, then there's the freeze and faint. So fright is our attentive, reactive immobility. We first perceive a danger, kind of stop. Sometimes it's initial freeze it's called, sometimes it's called alarm. Stop, get really alert, listen, take in all kinds of uh, input, smell, sight, sound, touch. Then we prepare. Once we move from fight, from fright, we kind of have to make a decision. Is this something I can get away from? Or is this something I'm going to have to fight to get out of? So then we move into that flight and fight. From there, in the midst of fight, our body and our mind make a decision like, can I get out of this? It's, all, it's already too late to run. Now I've got to make a decision. I fight. Ah, I, this, this bear is too big. I can't overtake this bear, this bear. So now I'm just going to freeze. Tonic immobility. Body goes waxy kind of freeze. And then the last is the body starts to shut down and you faint. So each time we experience a dangerous situation, potentially traumatic situation, we move through the, this cascade. And the more the traumas that people experience, just like we have with those stones, it's called a building block effect. They start to build one on top of the other. And so if one where we came to and, and froze, the mind starts to develop a bit of a pattern of moving through this defense cascade in a particular way to get to these reactions. So what does that mean for us in our work? when we work with folks that have been traumatized? How does it manifest post-trauma? Well, if someone is experiencing that fright experience, they may present with a sense of anxiety, a sense of mistrust, resistance. So think about you're getting into, um, if you are accustomed to perceiving danger, like you're going to be hypersensitive to everything around you. You're a little jumpy, not trusting the situation, not sure that it's safe. And a natural and beneficial reaction, reaction to that anxiety and that mistrust is resistance. So our clients that are post-trauma, it would be natural to be a little mistrusting of even the best of circumstances, a little anxious and even the best of circumstances, a little unsettled, a little resistant. 
moving from that fright position into one of flight. Someone's used to responding to that traumatic situation by avoiding. Avoidance often manifests as addiction. So we would expect someone in a post-trauma state, post-trauma disturbance, right? To be a little avoidant, maybe to be late for meetings, to not finish tasks that we ask them to finish, to be inconsistent in terms of what they're doing. Let me get into the fight. Manifests as aggression or anger, both which can be conceptualized as more um, direct forms of resistance, conflictual resistance. So I would expect or anticipate someone to be agitated, easily frustrated, quickly overwhelmed, and met with like acting out behavior. And the last one that we see, especially in clients who have had um, kind of extreme or severe traumatic experiences, is that of kind of the, the faint freeze direction. So as we're thinking about the freeze, right, and like, uh -uh, I can't fight this. The situation's too overwhelming. I'm, instead of freezing, I'm going to kind of like, ah. I'm going to fawn into it. I'm going to kind of be over sharing, over willing, don't have a good sense of my boundaries. I'm going to give my boundaries away. People pleasing kind of fits into that too. Overly accommodating. And the last place that we see is dissociation. When someone gets to that point of complete overwhelm, there's no way out here. I'm just going to shut off and dissociate. Clients leave their bodies. Again, in kind of extreme circumstances, they faint, pass out, start to lose them. And so we see all of these. If we're working with a population that we know has traumatic experiences, we need to be aware of all of these potential presentations and how that might impact the work that we do. Now, already we can kind of see like, whew. all right, so I'm seeing this. Well, what do I do about it? Right? And so already the awareness moves us towards wanting to do something about it. And so we need to understand that we have to have partnerships to help us do that work. Because if we're not trained ourselves to do the work, it's not okay, getting back to the bee metaphor, if you're not trained to take care of bees, it's not okay to just open the top, bees start swarming, and you run away. It's not healthy for the bees, it's not healthy for you, it's not healthy for the system. So I want to think about the, oops, sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself. Think about the consequences. I put all these wonderful transition like effects in there. And in the sake of time, I'm just kind of blasting through it. So consequence, consequences of trauma, when we think about uh, kind of our work and how it shows up then uh, in our interactions with others, just really generally and kind of surface level thinking and engagement is that Trauma has lasting impact and consequences for us across a wide range of dimensions. Both intrapersonal, so the individual disturbances, as well as interpersonal disturbances are where we most often see them. Well, we know that those, especially interpersonal <laughs> dimensions, then start to disrupt systems, and contexts and other folks, even well meaning to provide care, can create disruption and disturbances there. So, how can we see uh, some of this trauma, some of the behaviors that might uh, emerge 
in a person that we're talking to, a client that we're talking with. So there's in, intrapersonal, there's issues related to trust, or control, power, right? There may be some physical injury or disability as a consequence of the trauma. either actual from the traumatic event, or psychosomatic, where there's a projection into that. It's cognitive impairment. We're not able to think clearly, not able to respond clearly. Emotional volatility. Moving through relation to tears, and kind of the, call it labile in our, in our field of psychology. Then there's the interpersonal disturbances. Again, back to that issue of trust. Maybe they're not trustworthy. They're not trusting others. They don't adhere to rules or the systems. It's a sense of attachment. Don't really invest much. Personality issues in terms of how they get their personality needs, their personal needs or ego needs met and show up in diagnostic language like narcissism or borderline personality. And those move into our clinical issues, right? That they're folks that meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, addiction, anxiety, and different somatization uh, diagnoses. So now I'm going to shift a little bit into how do you incorporate an understanding of trauma into your work with RIM communities. So first thing I would say is that it's really important for all of us um, to make sure that our language is specific and transparent and person first, right, that represents other people. And so I would change that my question before into look something like this, like how do you incorporate an understanding of trauma into work with community members, that's the person, who have refugee, immigrant, or migrant status. So one thing I work, I teach uh, budding counselors here at Georgia State University. And one thing I really tried to impart to them is to not use jargon. Any time that you're talking to a client especially is to not use abbreviations and not use jargon, to be really clear and precise in your language and transparent and inclusive that we talk about people, not acronyms, not things. It's challenging because also in the academy, I know we use that as a little bit of shorthand to communicate with one another. We need to make sure that every communication that we have that involves clients is explicit and inclusive. Because we need to humanize our care. We need to make sure that every time we come in contact with another person, we have full awareness and understanding that that is a person in front of us. They may represent part of a project. They may have or hold really important information or stories for us that we know will not only benefit us, but will benefit them as well is to recognize even in our extreme excitement that there's a person in front of us that needs to be cared for and taken care of with concern. So how do we make our trauma-aware care? We prioritize person rather than project. So I kind of talked about this one. I want to think about collaborating and doing uh, with a partner rather than two or for someone. This gets back to that control and power. It's incumbent upon yourself to educate yourself as much as possible about the experiences of your clients, know who they are, why they're there, how they got there, where they're coming from, and don't rely on your clients to provide that information for you. There's lots of information about this that you have access to. You want to avoid re-traumatizing your clients. How do we re-traumatize them? By having them repeatedly tell their story, 
are parts of their story, are pulling out part of their story out of context to share with others. You need to think about the ecological factors of where they're going, how they're getting to their uh, service, their care provision. You wanna make sure that they have control. Do they have some say in their treatment or their interventions or the research that they're participating in and that they understand that control? And then also really thinking about touch and body positioning, being aware of kind of the culture, back to this educating yourself of what those relationships might have meant in their previous life or their previous experiences. I want to provide opportunities for self-determination, make sure that their choices for service, solicit feedback and design and input. You don't coerce or punish if folks are not participating. And probably the most important is just be a good human. Take time to listen, fully listen, and not listen for what you want to hear, but to really receive and listen to the person. And to be able to see the people that you're interacting with in their eyes, which is really hard on this kind of venue. Understand them, to take time, to demonstrate empathy, communicate respect and safety, honest, and practice humility, both interpersonally as well as culturally. We teach full courses on being a good human. A lot of our programs structured around these kinds of things. So this is just kind of touching the kind of the basic idea of it. Some other ideas I have for you for trauma aware care. So you want to let your participants set the pace where they can. Uh, Destigmatize trauma and the treatment for it. A secret, lots of us experience trauma. We want to be sensitive with the information that people share, but not make it hard to access care or support. We recognize that trauma is not only a difficult experience, it can lead to growth and resilience. I'll ask you to think back to that backpack. Imagine if you've spent a life carrying around a backpack of stones and rocks, you're probably really strong. Probably a pretty fit to be able to walk through this world still still carrying all of those. So to have that respect and acknowledgement and not to um, arbitrarily make vulnerable our populations that we work with. To recognize that there's strength and resilience and coping already resident within that population. When thinking conceptually about a person, we want to think about what happened rather than what is wrong with them. Right? Something happened to them. There's not something intrinsically wrong with that person. And this next one is the same. That a person's behavior they have been developed as functional. A crisis situation or in a dysfunctional environment. And all they know is to utilize those same strategies and one that now we may all perceive as safe. They have yet to perceive it as safe. And so to recognize that. They're using the best and most functional behavior sometimes that they have. Trauma resolution doesn't mean removal or taking those stones out of that backpack. It means integrating them into the backpack. A person's story is really sacred to them, it is an important part of who they are and how they've come to be. So we don't want to take those stories away. We want to be really a judicious in how we care for and utilize those stories moving forward and to make sure that they integrate into a person. And then the last part uh, I would say is to really recognize your critical role in co-regulating with a client or a participant or a friend and creating that sense of connection. We heal in connection to others and most, many of those traumas involve a disruption in connection to others. And so we want to be a curative or a healing presence. So in all of our experiences that we're aware of that. All right, see, I'm coming close to time. I wanna save us a little time. So I've got just two more slides, bear with me. Really important is to nurture self-awareness and self-care. 
to recognize that if you are working in spaces where folks experience, experience trauma, that you yourself, just by the nature of listening to traumatic stories, are being traumatized. <laughs> Secondary traumatic stress now is a criterion for PTSD in the DSM-5. It's also known as vicarious trauma. That's basically just hearing other people's stories on an ongoing basis. It's to compassion fatigue and burnout. We spend a lot of time in our program. I spend a lot of time in supervision with practitioners, clinicians out in the field, working through how do I heal my own trauma and my own experience just by the nature of the work that I do. Do that by learning to set and maintain interpersonal boundaries of when to turn work off, when to say no to clients or participants, when to say enough is enough, when to pull in other networks or other supports to kind of help you. You want to commit to self-care as part of your professional identity as well as your personal identity. I have a student one year who said that uh, they used self, they thought about self-care as a part-time job that they needed for survival. I was like, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. It's, it's that important. You want to do your own trauma work to learn your story. This is really important and something we don't necessarily think of outside of these clinical settings because somebody else's trauma experience will connect to yours. Again, we're socially connected with one another. And if someone is telling you of a difficult situation, in order to connect with them, you'll automatically relate it to parts of your own life. And so you need to be aware of your own trauma narratives, your own trauma stories, and do your own trauma work. Really important. Gets into that old psychoanalytic notion of countertransference. And you want to develop consistent practices of grounding and self-reflection. Final thoughts I'll leave you with, and then I'll ask you for conversation or questions if you have any. Curious to know your thoughts or your reactions, your experiences, but I would say throughout, whether you're a researcher, lay helper, a community member, community partner, you're a clinician, you're a friend, like only ask questions once you're prepared for the response. Doesn't matter what you plan to do with the answer or how great your project is or how great you believe your intervention is or how great you believe your question is. Be intentional in how you use those questions. It's just like that beehive. Like, I wanna find out what's going on. Well, that's a great thing to think about. You got to be prepared for the bees that are inside. What are you going to do once you get inside of that? So think all the way through and that preparation may be for you personally or building a network around you before you actually ask those questions. Also, trauma is a common and widespread experience. We all have it. We all experience it and we all will continue to experience it individually, collectively. Consequences of trauma will appear differently in people. Everybody reacts differently. Trauma-informed care, again, both awareness and response. And the last thing, can't leave you without asking you to please support our pollinators. Every chance you get, plant some wildflowers. Just, you know, just carry a little seed packet in your pocket. If you're walking on some grass, just throw out some wildflowers every now and then and then avoid pesticides. Our bees need your help. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's what I got for you, yep. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see, Dr. Erickson, you have a question. Um, I can read it. Um, so Jonathan, Dr. Erickson says, can you make a few comments specifically about refugees and your work there. Yeah, so I wonder what you would like me to, to say specifically about work with refugees and kind of refugee populations. I think it's important to recognize that um, folks are coming from uh, the experience of being a refugee, of being displaced is, and it's, 
in itself traumatic. And so it's kind of a layered and complex um, experience. And I would also say that the, um, sometimes the most impactful experience of trauma is not the most apparent or is not the one that we would recognize as like, oh my gosh, that's really scary. Right? Trauma shows up for people in really different ways. Um, and so where I might think like, oh my gosh, you had to, um, like there was gunfire around, people were shooting at you, like, oh, that must have been really terrifying. So I'm like, yeah, it's not so bad. What's really bad is that, like, I had to leave behind my frog that I caught. Like, you know, that that somehow that relational piece or that experience was some uh, somewhat more significant to that person. Um, I think it's also, you know, some of the work that I've been doing um, with a group um, with narrative exposure therapy is um, an approach that I've uh, been working with um, specifically with refugee populations as well as other uh, folks that have experienced trauma. It's a, a blend, it's an intervention that blends both um, kind of an exposure style uh, intervention with uh, human rights narrative. So it's a way of walking clients through uh, their trauma experiences, um, kind of exposing them to that, kind of having them detail all of uh, that trauma experience specifically so that they can reorganize and refile that um, experience in their brain. So for many folks that are currently in uh, traumatic states right now, that's a um, difficulty of discerning between present experience and past experience of having that past intrude on the present. And it leads to a lot of the criteria for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, that you're reacting in real time to something that has happened in the past. And so narrative exposure therapy uh, walks clients through the experience of kind of refiling with the brain, putting them back and having them move through uh, that experience of the trauma so that the brain can connect both cold as well as hot. So hot being the traumatic experiences, cold being kind of more the mundane or everyday experiences uh, of the situation. And connecting those two allows them to move that memory back into a kind of a more organized filing system. The result of that um, experience or kind of the interaction with the client at the end of it, uh, there is a narrative that's written, which is the story of that experience that they can then utilize um, for communication with any agency that they interact with, their family, their friends. It's a way of accounting for kind of the story of their life without them having to retell it over and over and over again. And so it's a useful, um, it's been used, it was designed actually to be used uh, in the field in high conflict areas where there was ongoing uh, trauma and complex trauma uh, with warfare and um, extreme conditions. And now it's kind of starting to make its way into clinical populations uh, and, and has worked with uh, refugees worldwide. Of really kind of helping folks. So a lot of our care, we wanted to resource people as best as we can, uh, but it's really hard when somebody's in a trauma state to accept any kind of support or help until they've resolved like, whew, I'm safe. And part of the net intervention helps someone uh, with not just emotionally, but cognitively with their brain, get into a safe place and start to trust their interpretation of what is presented in front of them. And so with refugee populations, again, even just the, the immigration story of how you've come to be in front of me is a trauma. And so at the very least, it would benefit um, all populations to have just kind of a basic intervention. Nice thing is it doesn't really move into, it's different from, um, I go on and on about this. So you'll have to like, okay, no, it's, um, it's time limited. It's not open-ended. It's a cognitive behavioral intervention. And many of those are typically um, kind of capped 
um, yeah, I could do a whole workshop on the um, intervention itself, but it's really lovely and um, it kind of fits into a lot of indigenous healing practices because at the at the center of it is storytelling and really communicating and sharing stories and, and what stories mean to a person um, in their own words. I don't know if that helps. I, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> you gotta give me a like, okay, no, it's good. Other questions or concerns? Yeah, other thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. So if there are any left, any remaining questions that are burning, please, you know, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself or enter something in the chat. I'll, I'll kind of count to five. I have a lot of questions for you, Jonathan. I know we don't have time for them. We'll have to fine. have you back. Um, I, my brain is buzzing um, related to trauma sensitive practices in the context of research recruitment and enrollment um, in, in research studies that I would love to talk more about. Um, but I think this is a good stopping place and is a really good introduction to this content, which I know is very dense and, you know, like you said, we could spend many, many sessions on it. Um, so we appreciate your time introducing us to this today. And, um, you know, if there are any, you know, questions or concerns, feel free to direct them to, to Jonathan or me. Um, please sign up for our PRC newsletter to stay in the loop about our events at prc.gsu.edu. And we look forward to seeing some or all of you at next month's event, um, which will feature um, folks from the uh, Refugee Clearing House, um, which is uh, at the University of Minnesota. They're going to talk about all of their work um, outreaching to refugee, immigrant, and migrant populations in the context of COVID um, in particular. So thank you all and look forward to seeing you next time.